Smartcast. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. You know, the default of a lot of managers and corporations is, well, we'll just take some more time to, you know, get the buy-in that we need or to answer the questions or to polish up the business case or, or whatever. And, and as a startup founder, it's like, we got to go. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. It is a cold day here in North Carolina, and this episode is brought to you by our sponsors, Ignite Management Services and Liberty Strength. These sponsors help me bring these shows to you each and every week, so I encourage you to click on their links below and check them out. Also, I want to remind you that the Qualified Leadership Book Series, which concludes all of my best-selling leadership books is now available on my website, johnsrunny.com, and you get all three books for 15% off the Amazon and Barnes & Noble price, but this offer is only available on my website. This is a perfect way to get 2024 off to a powerful start, so check it out at johnsrunny.com. Well, that is it. Today, we're going to be talking about the comparisons between military, corporate, and startup leadership, and my guest is Carrie Sparrow. Carrie is a former naval officer who served on nuclear fast attack submarines, and after the military, he worked in a large corporation before he ended up starting his own company. Like me, he transitioned between three distinct leadership environments, and we sat down and talked about the differences and similarities in the leadership styles required to be successful in each of these distinct organizations. Now, I had a great time sitting down with Kerry and learning from his experiences, and I know you'll love this conversation as well. So are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Carrie Sparrow. Carrie is the founder and CEO of Wagescape, which is the world's largest and most comprehensive platform for real-time intelligence on the labor market. He's an experienced business leader and engineer who has thrived throughout his career with his entrepreneurial approach and key eye for innovation opportunities. Carrie is a former Navy nuclear engineer where he served on nuclear fast attack submarines. Now, I'm excited to have another submariner on the show to talk about his experiences in the military, corporate, and startup leadership. So, Kerry, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, John. I am glad to have you on the show. I'm glad to have another submarine you're on here. We have a lot of military, uh, former military uh, guests on the show, but uh, very few submariners. So, thanks for coming on the show, and I'm excited to hear hear about your story and your transition. And we have very similar career paths, so I'm kind of anxious to hear your experiences compared to mine. So. But first of all, tell us about Wagescape. So uh, what is it that you do in your company and why did you start this company in the first place? Yeah, so let me just preface this by acknowledging that I'm a bit of a geek and I tend to see <laughs> things through kind of geeky lenses. Um, Wagescape, Wagescape helps you understand what's going on with jobs, with pay, with skills, with if you're hiring people, where the people you want to hire are. Um, we sell largely to uh, to big businesses, um, and we sell data. That's our business, is we sell data um, about what's happening in the labor market right now. It turns out that the data about what's going on with jobs and pay and, and talent, touch, everything about the labor market touches everybody every day, because we all need jobs, we all have to get paid, um, touches every person, every family, every community, every organization, in different ways, but the information about it by any objective standards is really pretty bad. It's very imprecise. Um, there's lots of people that take special training in order to understand what the you know, economy is doing. 
Uh, that's not portable training. There's lots of different ways you can look at the economy. Um, it's very late, so the information is not as actionable, especially since the pandemic when you've got wage inflation that's going up at, at historically high rates. Um, and you've got things like remote work influencing kind of how people you know, find jobs, what they can do for careers, and where people need to go to, to find talent and what they need to pay them. The, the world works at a much faster rate. And, you know, when I was in, in my, you know, prior positions, I saw kind of how much waste there was because how much work had to go into finding out simple things, like how much should I pay someone? And where can I go to find the people that I need to fill these positions? Or what are my career options? Or if I go back to school, what should I go back to school for? Um, that's going to give me a fulfilling career and and hopefully boost my you know the value I get from it. And these are all really tough questions to answer with real data. There's lots of people that have opinions, but when you dig into it, the opinions aren't based on any data. And and I saw that there was a better way to do it. And se seven years ago, I founded Wagescape, um, and we built a technology platform that allows us to track what's going on in the labor market at a very very comprehensive level, all real time, updated daily. We track, we track about 85% of all the jobs that are being created. We get pay on most of those. We, um, we track who's in the market. We have almost a billion, you know, a billion individuals um, with the information that they've agreed to share publicly in our database. We've got data from 25 million hiring organizations. We've got almost half a billion, you know, jobs that we've recorded, and so um, very large database that folks use. To understand what's going on right now, and uh, and then we sell that to folks that um, build other applications. In some cases, those applications are about hiring or about compensation. In other cases, they're about things like um, uh, predicting future business performance based on hiring patterns. Uh, so there's lots of ways that that data can be used, and and it all started with the idea that. If you've got a market, it works efficiently if you've got good information, and it works very inefficiently if you have bad in information. And if you're going from bad information to good information, then you're significantly increasing efficiency and opening up the doors for really, really significant innovation. And so that's what we we pursued. That was a very geeky vision on my on my part. It was entirely bootstrapped. The company I founded the company with my own money. We haven't taken in any outside money in the seven years we've been running, um, now going on eight years. And uh, um, although we might in the very near future. Uh, and so, you know, gradually uh, we've been growing. We've been growing about 30% a year um, for the last few years. So it's, uh, you know, it's been an interesting ride. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think one of the things that I, th I think a lot of, like, especially older managers don't realize is the the growth of data, data analytics and what it can do for us in running our companies. And I know, you know, I'm 56 myself and, you know, the 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 way we made decisions, hiring decisions and, and pay decisions back when, you know, I first started my corporate days, th those are obsolete. You know, I mean, right. we need to be using data to make better decisions in, in everything that we do in business. So it's interesting to see that you you know, seven years ago, jumped on this bandwagon of, of what's really essentially a, a shift in the way we do business, which is uh, all about data and data analytics to help drive decision making. So interesting to see that you, I think you got in early on a really important trend and you're in the area where I think is most critical, which is, is pay people hiring, especially now where we've seen such a dynamic shift in the labor market uh, post-pandemic. And so very much a dynamic uh, area of, of business today is hiring wages because now people are working two to three years instead of maybe four to six years, right? And so there's, right. a, there's a lot more turnover. There's things mm -hmm. like quiet quitting. There's things like, uh, you know, trying to, to, trying to find people that are going to be staying within your organization and, and, and finding those, that talent. Uh, yep. So, so it's really, it, 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 I'm, I'm excited that you got in kind of at the, around the early stages of data analytics uh, with the come when it comes to human resources. Yeah. I've always had kind of an affinity for analytics. I got an engineering background just like you. Um, and so uh, it's, or anyone in submarines had an engineering background basically right. by default. 
uh, whether we liked it or not. <laughs> right, exactly. And so, uh, but I always had an affinity for for analytics. But in the HR space, there were pockets that did analytics, but they didn't do it with great data. And in general, uh, decisions and careers were made more on conventional wisdom, um, you know, combined experience, and the ability to articulate a logical argument or an emotional argument. Um, but but really, you know, this isn't specific just to HR, but using data in a very, um, you know, deliberate way to make decisions is not something that has is, is really been pervasive until, you know, it's starting, I would say it's starting to, but, um, but it's interesting. Um, you know, we make our business out of showing people truth and, and you'd think that that would be universally accepted as a good thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not because the truth could be different than what, you know, someone you're trying to influence thinks the truth is. And uh, well, maybe... the, the the research I've read said that older managers are threatened sometimes by data analytics because uh, the, 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 the things that made them successful in the past, they can no longer use anymore, like the gut feel, the intuition, uh, the emotional right. arguments, as you mentioned, <laughs> those, right. don't, those don't fly in the face of what this is, what the data says. So. It's yeah. interesting to see this shift. It, it definitely is um, tougher for older managers, as as we say. Well, but the you know the younger when the younger manager says, but the data says this, <laughs> and so it's right. part of us. Part of it is being able to, especially as an older manager, to be able to say, look, I recognize that the world is changing and that this information is out there. Now I have to think differently. I have to change my paradigm if I want to be successful as a leader in this new world. Yep, I think that's exactly right, and I think that. You know, even for, you know, um, you know, data analysts, data, data scientists, or even just anyone who's using data day to day, uh, there's a whole other set of skills that are relatively new to the scene around being able to influence with data. You can't just put numbers in front of people yep. and expect them to accept it, nor should you, right? You should expect a healthy degree of skepticism around where does that come from? Because um, that's what, I mean, you should be applying yourself. Um, but you've got to be able to tell a story. And in order to be able to tell a story and make it relevant, you've got to be able to connect with people. You have to understand their context. You have to understand what their interests are. You have to understand their language, their preferences. All those skills of good storytelling become even more important, I think, when you're using data to try to influence, you know, op you know understanding options or, or, you know, influence a direction. And that's something that um, I think has just started to be recognized, but it's definitely not something that has been very deliberately taught. And I think that now folks are realizing, you know, if you're in the world of data, you've got to understand how to translate that into stories that people can relate to. Yeah, again, what I've seen is that the the, the concept of being bilingual is critical to bringing data into business. So yep. yeah, so your point is is well taken. The research even shows that that's how you get, uh, how success with, uh, with data is being able to be bilingual. And yep. be able to speak to the boomers, <laughs> so and, what, and what's important to them, so for sure, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, from let's tell, talk to us a little bit about like what it was it like for you going from a corporate job where you have, I say, you know, guaranteed income. It's not guaranteed, but more uh, steady income. Um, you know, maybe more certainty in your life to being a tech startup founder. What was that transition for you like? So I came out of, I was, um, I was a global vice president at a pretty big company. They would have been a fortune 10 company, um, and, uh, was responsible for all the workforce management infrastructure worldwide. Uh, so all the HR systems, the, all the data, the processes, the tech, all of that in about 60, 60 countries and about, about a hundred organizational ent entities. Um, and so I got to, you know, I had a big team. Um, I uh, was able to plan things out a couple years in advance, uh, managed the budgets that, you know, were known, uh, traveled on a pretty regular schedule, but not an onerous schedule. Prior to that, I was in consulting as a management consultant that I traveled on a ridiculous schedule. But uh, um, so, so it was pretty planful, um, I would say, and pretty well supported. You've got a lot of support systems around you. Uh, not just team members, but lots of processes and and you know access to things, and um, and also you've got in general a philosophy that is about increasing certainty. I would say, 
managing risk out of the organization, uh, really honing in on on kind of a certain truth. And uh, when you get in a startup, all that goes away. And not only, like you can come in with the best network, you could come in with, you know, towering skills, you could come in with a lot of money. And very quickly, everything that you had as an asset, except yourself, will dwindle in value very quickly. I don't know if this resonates with your own experience, but oh, it's it, I'm I'm shaking my head because this is like my life because I had big teams, big budgets, uh, like you said, certainty, uh, you know, predictability, you know, and you go to like a small team and and like like I don't even like I like I have a closet full of button down shirts I don't wear anymore. <laughs> right, just, it, right. It's completely overnight. Like I became I, this. I used to go to the dry cleaners once a week, and right. now I go twice a year. I go twice <laughs> a year, literally. Uh, yeah. So. Um, so all of that, all that stuff that you become used to, uh, and you don't even realize it goes away. Um, and, and instead you get other things, right? And so, but the, the biggest thing that went away was this whole notion of managing risk out because the one thing, I mean, on any given day now, and in the entire time since I founded Wagescape and for the foreseeable future, there are uncountable things that will kill this business that are beyond my control. I mean, if I yes. lose, you know, two of my three biggest clients, I'm out of business. Mm. Uh, if I, you know, if I lose half, you know, if I have a retention problem with my leadership team, I'm out of business. Uh, if the laws change in certain parts of the world around data usage, I'm out of business. I have no control over those things. So the notion of risk is totally different. And you realize that the thing that you do have control over is speed. So... The biggest risk that I face is taking too long to get things done and taking mm -hmm. too long to get results. So it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, and, and so, you know, the default of a lot of managers and corporations is, well, we'll just take some more time to, you know, get the buy-in that we need or to answer the questions or to polish up the business case or or whatever. And and as a startup founder, it's like we gotta go. We got a problem. We gotta, you know, test out our options and we gotta go. And maybe we don't pick the best option but we got to learn how to course correct really quickly. So we, you know, when you build an organization like that, you build around resiliency and adaptability and agility. And a lot of the stuff that, uh, you know, used to be important um, just isn't important uh, anymore. And it's interesting you, you bring it up because <clears throat> one of the things I recognize, I, you know, I built a team from scratch in my case, and I and and I you mentioned resiliency, and this is a big thing that I, I focus in on. And I, and I was trying to build a resilient team. And I was trying to think, what's the best way to build a resilient team? Well, build by, bring on resilient people or people that had resiliency in their in their past lives. Uh, but one of the things that's interesting is I had one employee that came on board that couldn't make the transition. That one transition you talked about, going from certainty, uh, planning, uh, you know, risk mitigation to we got to go now. It's got to get done. Speed. So making that switch to speed. And so all my other employees that maybe came from big company life were able to make that transition. I had one that couldn't make that transition because it was so different. It was a foreign language to to this person. And so, yeah. and he was close to me. He was a friend. He actually worked for me in the big company. But but I had to say, you know, we got to we got to part company because it's not really working out because it because you know, of that transit. That shift, and I always, I always said in the beginning when we started the company is we have to have small company thinking. We have to have small company thinking. And it was this idea of speed. And speed yeah. was critical to us. And um, I think the, the founder of uh, um, LinkedIn once said, and I, I say this a lot to my employees in the, in the early stages, which was, uh, if you're not embarrassed by the first iteration of your product, you're not moving fast enough. And yep. so that was always my mindset is that we got to go, we got to go fast and we got to fix it along the way. And yep. it sounds like that's, that was your sort of your philosophy as well. Well, and, and I would say that, you know, being in submarines and, and um, I think regardless of whether you were in fast attack submarines or in missile boats, um, there's a degree of unpredictability in, mm -hmm. uh, in the actual operations. And so I was, you know, for the last year and a half, I was, the communications officer and I was right in operations the whole time and and literally you come into work one morning and and find out you got a new mission order and you you know within 36 hours you got to be gone someplace that you didn't anticipate and so you know that notion of being you know resilient to unpredictability was 
With within, I mean, and the other thing the Navy gave was a good structure, right? So, you know, you can't break a nuclear reactor just to go, you know, get out of port a few hours earlier, right? So, um, you know, but that kind of exposure to real time operations, I think, was one of the things that that I took away from my time in in the Navy, and I think that is a kind of a skill that doesn't really have a name. Um, I think a lot of people who make the transition out of the military don't know how to name their skills in ways that people will understand them. But that kind of operational orientation definitely played well by the time I founded, you know, by by the time I founded WageScape. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. As a leader, you're responsible for the mission and the people assigned to you. Regardless of the size of your team, employees are depending on you for their lives and careers. For the sake of your team and the people who entrust you with this role, you need to master the skills to become a great leader. Best-selling leadership author John Rennie is proud to introduce the Qualified Leadership Book Series. This new series teaches you how to become a people-centered leader. Great leaders know that employees who are respected, appreciated, and allowed to grow will go the extra mile. These books provide real-world leadership wisdom written from a hands-on perspective. If you want to be a more effective leader, this is the one book series you should read this year. This three-book series contains the following best-selling leadership books. I Have the Watch, You Have the Watch, and All in the Same Boat for one low price of $39.99. Begin your journey to become a leader worth following. Go to johnsrenny.com and get your order in today. This episode is brought to you by Ignite Management Services. Ignite is led by Mike Watson, who you might remember from episode 137. Mike and his team believe that everything starts with leadership, whether it's strategy execution or culture cultural transformation. It's the role of the leader to create the conditions for their people to succeed. The team at Ignite can help you develop critical habits to enhance your leadership capability and transform your business. Ignite Management is now offering the Resilient Leadership Assessment Tool. This is an online questionnaire designed to assess and guide leadership development, coaching, and team building. It provides leaders an opportunity to gain insights into their leadership strengths and development needs. After taking this assessment, you will receive a custom detailed report that provides practical and actionable recommendations to enhance your effectiveness. I have taken this assessment myself and found it to be extremely valuable in helping me make changes to my leadership approach. Right now, Ignite is offering 15% off the price of this tool to the deep leadership audience. Go to ignitemanagement.ca and enter the code START15 at checkout to get started today. This episode is brought to you by Jeremy Clevenger at Liberty Strength. As a high-performing leader, you know that leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about leading by example. And for most people, the one area that they are lacking when it comes to leading by example is their health and fitness. By improving your health and fitness, every other area of your life improves. Your energy skyrockets, your sleep improves, your confidence increases, and more. But how can you get and stay fit as a busy leader? Well, you do what you've always done. You hire the best people for the job. Don't struggle on your own. Put liberty strength in your corner. Jeremy and his team will work with you to take your physique, mindset, nutritional habits, and more to the next level with his step-by-step, all-inclusive coaching program. I've worked with Liberty Strength for the past two years, and I'm in the best shape of my life, and I'm still hitting strength personal records at 56 years old. If you want to step up your game, reach out to Jeremy at LibertyStrengthTX.com to find out more and get your initial consultation scheduled with him today. What about like from a leadership perspective, what were some of the challenges you faced as you built a team from from the ground up? Um, I mentioned one I had, you know, I thought I had built the I had built the dream team, but one just couldn't make that shift. Uh, but um, what were some of the any any challenges you had when you built up your team? I had a, a couple. Um, I took a while before I brought people on board um, as uh as W-2 employees, as actual employees. So I started working with contractors myself, even I, I was classified as a, as a contractor. And, and the reason that I did that was because I knew we had to test things and we had to figure out the market and we had to figure out the technology and we would make mistakes along the way. And in some of those cases, mistakes would mean I actually don't need certain people and certain capabilities. And I would rather be able to move quickly from one to another 
and and working with contractors allows you to do that because that's kind of expected. And so one of my personal, you know, internal struggles was was reaching the point where I knew that I could no longer use that approach. I needed a team of dedicated, engaged leaders, um, and I needed to bite the bullet, you know, because now they got to get paid twice a month, whether you know there's enough money in the bank account or not, their lives, <laughs> families depend on that. And so there was a higher, so it was a bigger hurdle for me, right? I mean, that was a, a lot of people are like, why is that a big deal? And I'm like, for, as a founder, I think that's a really big step when you commit to, you know, having a payroll. Um, and so personally, that was one of the things that happened uh, about two and a half years ago, almost three years ago, where I realized we're onto something, but in order to go after it, I need really dedicated people. Um, another challenge is just sorting out kind of what's the right kind of person for the right kind of role. And and this is one where I was pretty lucky because I'd been thinking about it for a while, but um, I've always kind of thought about, you know, staffing a little bit differently. And I realized that there were a lot of people who were kind of being left behind in their careers because they had made really hard decisions. They had... Um, you know, they had new kids and they wanted to stay home with them. Um, or they had parents they had to take, uh, you know, take care of. Or they had some passion project that they just didn't want to let go of. And, you know, for me, I found that I could tap into those people and give them a pretty compelling opportunity. You know, I could still, you could be the head of marketing for a um, fast growing, really exciting high tech company and still only work half time. Um, and I will build your role around that. And so I made a few of those deals um, to get people that were, were extremely talented. And I had, you know, I had a couple of, actually several other founders saying, what, you know, you're only getting, you know, 16 or 20 hours a week out of out of your folks. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm getting the best 20 hours a week out of them. Yeah. And most engaged time out of them. And so, you know, figuring out the right, the right balance there um, and the right place to look for talent. Um, I think was a task. I was pretty lucky in that I had had virtual teams for a long time. And so I kind of thought a little bit differently about that. Then there are certain roles that I just wasn't good at, at picking, you know, I'll just be really upfront about it. And, <laughs> uh, and that weren't, you know, in my background per se, like I, I came out of consulting. I did well. I, uh, you know, when I got out of the Navy, I became a management consultant and I started in a big firm as an entry level associate. And I left 14 years later as a managing partner for a global part of the business, right? And so went all the way. So obviously successful. It was obviously good enough at selling. Um, but when it came to hiring product sellers, uh, we we didn't have a lot of success. And I didn't do a good job picking, uh, picking folks and supporting them. And I think we're in a really good spot now, um, but it took a long time. And so roles that I personally wasn't familiar with, um, I would do all of the things that you would expect. I would go ask advice. I would, you know, I'd look at how other people did it and watch what, you know, and listen to kind of how and what they looked for. But it took a number of iterations and those were expensive iterations. They were expensive in terms of direct costs. And they also were expensive that, you know, we didn't get the revenue that I was expecting from that. So, you know, our growth rate really suffered as a result of that mistake or those or several, those mistakes. <laughs> so that was, you know, another thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that you you bring up a good point with respect to building a team is that, you know, to make sure that you have really good um people where your weak spots are and um I think a lot of us who are operationally focused, you know, sales tends to tends to be like, oh, that should be easy, right? <laughs> Everything works, right? So right. you just need to find me a customer so I can show you how it works and it's not that easy. There's a whole process and um and, you know, again, you got to find, and, and the other thing too, is it's a different kind of sales when you're a new company, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of, um, uh, you know, you're, it's, it's a lot of missionary work and, and, and a lot of teaching people what you're selling, because it's different right. than other, other things that are out there. So there, you need a special type of business development person uh, right. in, in a new company. And I think, that that was an area where I got lucky with a young person that just had he had what it took and but it it was certainly not my skill set I I didn't have strengths there. Well, I I have come to learn you know what to look for, but 
I don't claim to be any good. I just claim to have a bunch of scars, you know? So, um, but, um, it's interesting your point about missionary work. I would say that that's definitely been the case uh, for us because, and that's another thing, which is, you know, important, I think to know is when you're, you know, when you're in a startup, um, you have to convince people to adopt you. If you've got bigger competitors, the safe bet is to go with the more established. Absolutely. And so you've got to be looking for the right profile of kind of early adopters on, on new or differentiated things. And that notion of, you know, like Jeffrey Moore's book, Crossing the Chasm, that notion of an adoption curve is, is I think really important to understand. For us, it was doubly important because not only did we need to get people to adopt kind of our platform and our, our software, um, but it's an entirely new space. The kind of data that we, you know, that we, we provide is something that nobody knew was available before. And so we had to educate people on the space and build confidence in, in the space. And we had to build influence, you know, networks of influencers, you know, that, that would endorse kind of the space. And then obviously by extension, they would endorse us, but we had two kind of adoption curves that, that we had to manage and two brands that we had to build one for the space and one for us. Mm. And that's still a work in progress. I would say. Yeah. I tell people, I remember I, you know, when we started the company, I put on a new shirt with a new logo I went to visit some of my old customers, you know, from my corporate days and customers that I had for a long time and they knew me and trusted me. And I talked to them about, you know, maybe trying some of our new products. And they said, I I don't know who you guys are. And I was like, well, you know me, like I was with the big company before. Now what is there to company. know? Right? So like, <laughs> well, yeah, because, but the big company is no risk. You, I don't, I, I don't know about your products. And, and so I'm not willing to take on you. So I remember being at, my eyes were open early on when I started making customer visits, talking about our new company was it, you know, <laughs> there was a lot more work to be done than just, oh, here I am with a new logo. And uh, that was, that was uh, eye opening, especially in a space uh, that we're in, which is very conservative. We we sell to electric utilities and they're very conservative customers. And so they're not willing to put anything on their network that has a potential risk associated with it because they don't want to lose power. That's the big right. thing, right? So, right. I mean, they are like the definition of conservative, right? Right, right. Yeah. So uh, it, was, it was a long, it was a learning curve in terms of uh, the speed at which we could introduce our products to the market because of people just said, I don't know who you are. Like, but the, yeah. even though I've been doing this for 30 years, they, they didn't know they didn't know who I was with this logo on my shirt. So yeah. it, it's definitely... Yeah, it's uh, always- it's always yeah. fun if you go out and buy swag for yourself, right? You know, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but uh, but then that's that. You know, there's a lot of real work that has to go with that. Uh, <laughs> I will tell you, you make me think of one thing that was a was an interesting learning. The last company I worked with was an industry leader in what they did. They were in a number of businesses, but but they were in fact the default, right? In a lot of cases, so nobody ever got fired by hiring my my last company, really. Mm. Um, the company I was at before that, when I was in consulting, was a global leader also. But we competed with other global leaders. And so we were, you know, we were, you know, a leader among leaders, whereas my my last company was kind of the top, you know, at, at the top yeah. in those areas. And I will tell you that sales is a lot easier when you're at the top. Oh, yeah. Because right? <laughs> work, you know, yeah. work and jobs and money come to you. Um, and... That's been kind of a guiding principle for Wagescape, which is, hey, we've got this great opportunity that this is a new space. We have to make sure that people see us as the leader in the space, not not one of the providers, but the leader. So brand is really important to us, you know, and, and brand in all of its dimensions. We've got to have product creds. We have to have service creds. We've got to have endorsement from other big influencers. So we worked really hard to you know make sure our clients included you know, the biggest kind of mavens in, in the spaces that we serve. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that's, uh, so that's something that has shaped kind of almost every decision, commercial decision uh, that we've had is how do we stay out in front? Yep. Because the cost of competition goes way up when you're not on the front. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, we, we both served on submarines. Um, you know, we, you you talked about the 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 operational tempo of a submarine, the flexibility. Uh, are there any other things that you you find that you are thankful that you did time on submarines that's really helped you be successful uh, in your startup career and in you know in your corporate career? 
Are there are there some experiences from that that you you've relied on? Well, I would say you know there's there's one kind of trait, um, which is just a high degree of self assuredness that comes from, you know, you and I were in our early twenties when we were supervising nuclear reactors, or when we were you know at you know in the mid watch, um, running basically the entire ship while everyone else was was asleep. A multi billion dollar platform. Um, with amazing capability in your, you know, in your mid twenties and doing that, and it it engenders a uh, a degree of self assurance that I think a lot of people don't have the benefit of getting, you know, until mm-hmm. many years later, if if not at all. And so that really, you know, served as my own personal platform for being able to trust my intuition about my own choices um, and take, you know, to recognize opportunities when they when they came along and then have the guts to take them and. And that's that's kind of how I've approached things. So there's there's that that piece, which I think a lot of people get from the military, um, and I don't think nearly as many people take advantage of it as the, uh, when they come out of the military. Specific to the submarine force, and 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 there's other you know parts of the military as well. The ability to run an operations schedule, like if when we pull into port, you knew all the maintenance that had to be done within a defined period of time. It was a very tight time frame. There were people that were immediately coming on board from, you know, the te- technicians from the tender, technicians from the shipyard, um, regulators that were coming on board, operations leaders, you know, from squadron or from other, multiple organizations were represented and they all had to be orchestrated. And we were the guys that were orchestrating it, right, on a minute to minute basis. And that, um, that kind of high intensity operations management, um, in the corporate world would be called something like operations management or project management or program management. And that's been kind of a core part of, of my career ever since. And, and I didn't have to learn it. I, I lived it, (laughs) you know, you lived it, uh, you know, for our first, you know, first time in the Navy and, and nobody called it that in the Navy. We just were watch officers, you know, and, uh, um, but the ability to, to manage, you know, a degree of chaos and manage lots of different, you know, competing uh, and intricate threads of activities and resources is turns out to be a really valuable skill uh, when you get out of the military. And, and if you know how to think about it that way, you can translate that skill into a great job, I think. Uh, absolutely. I think it's probably why I gravitated towards running manufacturing operations because they, yeah. they're incredibly complex, lots of moving parts. Um, and it, to me, it was the closest thing to the life on the ship. I mean, I, I just got, that's, that was, that was the, that was the juice I needed. I, I, I couldn't find it any place else in, in so running a man, I've run nine manufacturing plants and that's just where, where my joy was, is just, it's organizing chaos. That's exactly what it was. It was, yep. it was a hundred percent that. And that's where I found I was comfortable in chaos. Yep. Yeah. 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 My last, my last company had big manufacturing operations and, and I would go on tours and they would want to show me a lot of their internal procedures. I'm like, no, I just want to go look at the plant. Walk me through kind of yes, when raw material know. comes in to when product comes out and everything in between, just walk me through the whole thing. And, and I'm, you know, in bliss. Yeah. Uh, that's, like, that's, that's where we thrive. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That is interesting. You've, you, that, that experience you shared sort of helped me just understand why that's probably why I gravitated there because that's where the noise was that's where the action was that's where the difficult problems were it's like that that's where I want to be you yeah. know that's what this I was I was comfortable there so well th- this has been a great conversation we covered a lot of things um what final message would you like to leave with our listeners right now well I would say that you know especially vets or people who are on active duty that are transitioning out um, there's lots of there's lots of places that can use skills that you might not even know that you have. And there's lots of resources that can help you um, understand those skills and find a home for them in a way that's really fulfilling. And I would, it can be really intimidating. Making big transitions can be intimidating and you probably have more resources available to you than you think. So avail yourself of those resources. And I'm happy to serve as serve as one of them. But especially in today's world, um, you've got more opportunity than ever Anyone listening to this has more opportunity than ever to pursue your interests, pursue your dreams, and more opportunity to tap into resources that can help you do that. And um, you should you should have faith that that's there and uh, 
and take advantage of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, you, you veterans, if you're listening in, you have some remarkable skills. <laughs> the idea of flexibility, resiliency, adaptability, these are what makes uh, uh, startups successful. We want people like that on our team. So don't think of those skills as uh, non-translatable into business. Those are absolutely essential to business. So uh, so that's a great, uh, great message. I appreciate that. So um, how can people find out, how can our listeners find out more about you, Carrie, and Wagescape? It's easy. If you want to know more about Wagescape, just go to wagescape.com and you can reach us that way. If you want to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Well, fantastic. We're going to put links in the show notes for uh, Carrie's resources and, uh, and to be able to reach out and contact him. And again, if something in this conversation resonated with you, if you're thinking, hey, I want to start up a company, there's a couple of things in there that uh, Carrie could help me with, uh, reach out to Carrie. I mean, he'll be happy to talk to you, answer your questions. That's why uh, uh, Carrie came on the show is to talk about his experiences uh, through building his company, starting his company. And again, he's there to help you. If you've got questions, reach out to him. And again, if, you, if you're if you thinking about data analytics on the HR side, uh, which I highly recommend you think about if you're not thinking about it, uh, Wagescape is a resource for you as well. And we'll have the link in the show notes uh, below as well. So, uh, Carrie, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I learned a lot. Um, our experiences are very similar, uh, but I think you've given all of us a lot to think about when it comes to what it takes to really get a new company off the ground and kind of tapping into those veteran skills to be able to be successful. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share your experiences with our audience. It's been my pleasure, John. Well, thanks again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. Welcome to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing, where we harmonize your mind, body, and soul. I'm Amanda, your sound therapy expert. And I'm Stephen, the curious explorer uncovering the mysteries of sound. Together, we explore vibrations, frequencies, and the power of sound therapy and tuning forks. Discover ancient wisdom, reduce stress, and tune into a healthier life. Subscribe to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing today. Hey, it's Tim from 50 Years of Music with 50-Year-Old White Guys, the comedy podcast you had no idea you needed. Join Ben, Jeff, and me as we continue our musical road trip back through the years and around the globe. See, just when you thought all white guys were like Joe Rogan, you come across three educators trying to remember when we were cool. 50 Years of Music with 50-Year-Old White Guys. Electric acid.